And the way that you see things, it's almost uh, as a film director would see them. And I know that you have a, a cinematic view of life. I know that uh, movies have been a big part of your, uh, your experience. What, what are the movies that everyone should see? Oh, dear me. You know, I am so into a movie that when I see a movie, I forget all the other movies I've ever seen. <laughs> but, for instance, I saw Lion just a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, I am so happy that Paula and I <laughs> have brought into the world two movie buffs who can always say to me, Dad, you've got to see this. Um, our other two, not so much, they enjoy a movie, but um, it's great to have somebody say, Dad, you must, see, you, you must see this, or be able to say, oh yes, he was in that, and she was in, in that, etc. cetera. But um, I, there are two movies that, f for me, when somebody says movie, by the way, couple of beautiful movies that get lost because they're Irish movies. Um, one is Into the West, beautiful movie with Gabriel Byrne. And the other is Frankie Starlight. Um, it's a story, I, th I think it's by Mae Vinci, but anyway, um, I really, sometime try and reach for them. Into the West <coughs> and Frankie Starlight. Matter of fact, I think Frankie Starlight's been made as we speak. <coughs> I think it's playing in Dublin. Um, and it's been renamed, I think, Saving Frankie or something. Anyway, two movies that kind of are right up there in my front burner. One I saw, here we go, one I saw back in those 60s, Sorba the Greek. I was at a meeting in Toronto. We were living as a family in Vancouver, and I usually got the plane, said the 715, flight 149, and I sort of, it would be so great to go to the airport and lift off into the setting sun. I mean, talk about being a crazy romantic, but um, I, the meeting was, the, the committee meeting that I was down for was over early, and I had enough time, because in those days you could actually go to the airport and get a ticket and go on the plane. Remember that long ago, Planner? Yes. <laughs> and I noticed this movie, downtown Toronto, near Church House, and I went in myself, which I very seldom do. There's something about a movie that you like to have somebody to, to, re, to respond with. But I walked out of Zorba the Greek and I said, something big is happening, culture-wise. I kind of knew that I had seen something much bigger than just a movie. It was a different, it was two different ways of being in the world. One, the sort of the old, and they were not mutually exclusive, but they were now in dialogue. <coughs> that, you remember Alan Bates played the teacher? Very buttoned down, very reserved, etc. Anthony Quinn played Zorba, the very opposite, earthy, um, all of those things. And yet there was a meeting of the two of them. And I kind of, I kind of realize now that what I had been, what I was told by that movie was that the world was essentially changed and that this was going to be a both and from now on. You know, um, I mean, to this day, I, I often tell that moment in that movie where, it, I think it's near the end of the movie, where the Alan Bates character says to the Zorba character, he says to Zorba, he says, uh, they're down by the beach. And he says, Zorba, are you married? And 
Sarva takes a big deep breath and he says, married, wife, children, house, the whole catastrophe. <laughs> a wonderful moment. <clears throat> and then very soon after that, there's the magic of it, where Bates says to Quinn, it's, it's a very quiet scene, evening, just, it's on the beach. And he says to him, Zorba, teach me to dance. And they begin to move. And I realized that the whole world was being invited to dance in a new way. And it would never be quite the same again. That's a movie that meant a lot to me. The other <clears throat> is a small Danish movie, Babette's Feast, set in northern, set in the 1800s. Babette is a chef in Paris. And she must leave Paris because it's revolutionary times and she's on the wrong side. And she comes to this small village in Jutland where there is a kind of, it's dominated by this very, very uh, stern Lutheran pastor and his very quiet, um, inhibited congregation. And she is so grateful for refuge that she says, I want to give you as my neighbors. She's been there a couple of years. I want to give you a gift. I want to make a dinner for you. And the rest of it is the making of that dinner. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I sat there. <clears throat> there's a beautiful scene in it where through the movie, you know that there's a lot of stuff going on in that village of past hurts, pain, mistrust, resentments, etc. And they've never been resolved, and yet all of this religion is being preached every Sunday. And in this dinner, something happens that it becomes a kind of a feast of reconciliation. And what it said to me, my learning curve from Babette's feast was <clears throat> that in terms of power, Sacrament can often trump word. You know, there can be sermons about this, sermons about that, sermons about this. But to, but to share bread, to drink wine, and maybe most important, from a common cup, is so powerful. Babette's Feast and Zorba are to me big. Now there's a hundred other ones. Very first movie I was ever taken to, my dad took me. Texas Rangers. And they galloped up and down <clears throat> that valley in Hollywood that they all galloped up and down and made those movies <clears throat> in the 1920s and 30s, because I was only about eight. And they all, one of them died towards the end of the movie, and they all lined up, and they sang Old Lang Syne, and I cried my eyes out. <clears throat> And then round about the same time, my mom and dad said, we're going, to see, we're going to the pictures tonight. And I went to see Paul Robeson in Bozambo of the River. Um, bet you never saw that, did you? No. Oh, that's a treat waiting for you. Um, but I owe a lot to movies because um, it's linked for me in my life of saying, Tell, tell the story in images and have, that, have, it, have it running in your mind um, that you're not saying wooden things like, like um, Jesus came to Jericho and he did this and then he went to Jerusalem and he did that. But do the road, you know, do the road. It's, it's like that wonderful moment in Mr. Holland's opus, 
another wonderful movie um, where he's the teacher in a school. And he's the music teacher. And he's having a tough time, for many reasons. And, but he, he has a young girl in the school band. And she plays, it's, uh, it's the sax. <clears throat> but she plays it very woodenly. But Holland knows that she's good. And he begins to take her one on one. And there comes a session. Well, let's say her name was uh, Mary, doesn't matter. And she is, um, she's playing it, and she's playing it <coughs> very woodenly. <coughs> da dum, da dee, da dum, dum dee, da dum. That lovely song. And in desperation, he stops her and he says, Mary, when you play that, what comes to mind? And she says, I, I, I think of the sunset. And he says, Mary, play the sunset. And I very often say that to clergy, but preach the sunset. Not this happened, that happened, that this meant that, point one, point two, point three, <clears throat> preach the sunset. And she takes a deep breath and she goes, and it's beautiful. I've noticed that among some senior clerics uh, in their later years um, have changes in their attitudes, their, their thinking, their beliefs, often radical changes. And they begin to, it might have started with the God is dead argument or John Spong's controversial theories or, or perhaps it's just fatigue and burnout after a, a year, after a lifetime of ministry. But some begin to question um, the centralities of the Christian faith, the uh, virgin birth, the, the resurrection. Um, what, what's your response to that? Well, my response is, I guess, well, my response, and you'll be terribly surprised, is to tell you a little story. I am, oh, about six or seven. You know the Japanese, I often think of this, you know the Japanese have a saying that a child, until the age of seven, a child lives with the gods. And I am deeply grateful that I grew up in the Ireland of the 1930s. No industry, no big cities, no separation between city and country, really no, no separation between the generations. You had no problems being like your parents or like your grandparents because that's who they were and there was there was no kind of interruption culturally, but anyway. And it's Sunday afternoon, and we're a bunch of us, maybe about 20 of us, little kids, sitting in the front two rows of our parish church. And a young priest is talking to us. And it's one of those photographs in my mind. I just remember exactly what he looked like, where he was standing. He was tall above me. And he pointed up to the roof of the chancel of the church. It was very beautiful. Um, one of the things not realized about Irish Christianity is because some of its roots were from the East in the fourth century, um, that some of its art is, is takes part of the richness of orthodox art. And up in the chancel, up on the, uh, on the roof of it, there were stars and, well, here we go again. There were stars and planets and <coughs> angels and all of that sort of other world. And I say other world advisedly because this is, up on that roof, there was a magic world in the deepest sense, a magic world. 
And he looked at us and he said, you know, if you boys and girls sing loudly, that those stars shine. And I looked up and, you know, and, and then he gave us a hymn to sing and we sang and I looked up and I, I, I think they were shining a bit brighter. Okay, I'm seven. So there comes a time when I'm 18 and I say, what a lot of malarkey that was. <laughs> they don't shine. But there came a time in my life when I knew they do shine. Because they shine in my memory and they shine in my imagination. And they bring to me and they allow me access to other worlds. And that clicks into very, very well-known scholar um, whose name I'm having a senior moment about, and that's okay. I let it be and it may come. But he said, he talked about two ways of thinking. First, naivete, and second, naivete. First, naivete is in my case, as a boy, yeah, I think they are shining. Partly because, you know, I, I want them to, and I, my priest has said that they shine, and, and it looks beautiful, and, and I have the richness of childhood to to allow me to, to experience that. I am still living with the gods, therefore I can experience that. That's first naivete. But the trick this scholar said is to, to move into a losing of that. Lose your sophistication. Use your sophistication sometimes, and it, it, it dismisses your first naivete. But then what's really important is to discover a second naivete, which knows the reality of it all as an adult, but to be able to, to preserve the original. Again, I'll use without apology, the word magic. And I, I um, well, I, I, I got into that so much that I don't know where we are. You tell me where we are. <laughs> Changing of core beliefs. There, there, there are those who, some men, perhaps women, but mainly men, because they're of that period, uh, who seem to have had their core beliefs shaken uh, and begin to question things uh, as their years advance. Uh, that hasn't happened to you. No, I, um, I, I guess, I, well, I guess partly I've said it in that I am, um, Insofar as one can say anything about oneself, and one can, God knows one can be so wrong, but um, I, a person I identify very much with is C.S. Lewis, who uh, said that, um, he, who often in his writing shows that he, he never lost, he never lost uh, that umbilical cord to childhood. Now, yes, can it be dangerous? Because uh, we're not talking about being childish, I hope. But to, to retain, I, I mean, after all, somebody we know rather well said to us, unless you become as little children, you do not see the kingdom. And I think that 
I, I really think that Jesus is is being very <clears throat> he's being very Jungian there, um, and he's also being very Zen when he says that because he is saying that you need to journey beyond you need to journey beyond sophistication, beyond calculation, beyond systematic thinking, beyond all those things that have shaped us, that prose world of the Enlightenment <clears throat> that said the highest form of thinking is, is rationality. And I think when, when Jesus says you have to become a student, it's not to, not to neglect rationality, but, but to realize that there, is, that there are worlds beyond the rational, that are worlds of, worlds of imagination, worlds of the mystical, um, and it is terribly important to voyage in those worlds. For instance, I realized that growing up as I did, I grew up when there was still room, there was still room for, for, I'm, I want to be real here, but I also want to pay tribute to um, a world that gave me great riches, and that is the ability to imagine, the ability to, to realize that the Christian story is essentially is essentially a wonderful lyrical mystery. Um, I, I remember one day talking to our, she was 10 years old at the time. No, about 12. And we were talking across the table <clears throat> on Marguerite, Deirdre and I. And I was saying to her, you know, we are never going to know the we are never going to know the facts about what we call in Christian faith the resurrection. But one of the ways in which it becomes very powerful in our lives is it's not just saying somebody two thousand years ago rose from the dead. <clears throat> We can argue until the cows come home how that happened, if that happened. But the point is, why has it lasted 2,000 years? Why does it speak to us so powerfully? And why, if we absorb it into our lives and it works, why? Maybe that's what resurrection is for a Christian. I said, for instance, you notice in your life, when you go down, <clears throat> when you go down emotionally, you know one thing, that you will come up again, that you will rise. This was recorded July 7th, 2017. Producer of the series is Randy Murray. Cameraman is Cliff Caprani, and I'm Lyndon Grove. Thank you. <laughs>